So uh, it's uh, really my pleasure to introduce our keynote for the day. Um, Phil Sponnenberg from the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, I took a few bits off his CV in order to introduce him. They might be correct, they might not be. Um, That's probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> Bachelor of Science, Veterinary Medicine, Texas A&M University, 1975. That part's true. That's correct. Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, Texas A&M University, 1976. That's true, too. That's true as well. And <laughs> Doctor of Philosophy in Veterinary Medicine, Cornell University, 1979. That bit's true. That bit's also true. <laughs> so, Phil's main interests are the, the genetics of domesticated animals, home color genetics, conservation of rare breeds of livestock, diagnostic pathology, and reproductive pathology, so I'll hand it over to him, and our thanks to him for coming all the way from America for this meeting, uh, which I think is quite, uh, quite an honor of Shepherd. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and I, I'll apologize to Olivia once again. I left at 8 o'clock this morning to get here, and I got lost in London. <laughs> Eventually, a taxi cab got me found in London. And I have noticed one difference between walking through a herd of cattle and London is that the cattle move away from you <laughs> and let you pass. <laughs> um, my, we're going to talk about theory. We're going to talk about just field experiences. And some of those things actually coexist quite nicely, and some of them don't. And I just, OK. And we're already defeated. How do I make it? technology thwarting the scientists again. That's the problem. OK, so we're going to go Rewind. look at that. <laughs> OK, there is a molecular re revolution. And so we have more tools. More tools give us more results, and that's a good thing. And I'll apologize for the accent, but this is how we speak. Um, <laughs> well, and if you notice, um, most American last names are either German or Scandinavian but we speak what we say as English, and that may be some of the problem. <laughs> but we have more tools, we have more results, but the basics still apply. And the basics are that the genotype actually leads to the phenotype to some degree or another, and then the phenotype is generally caused by the genotype. So these are chickens, and you'll notice that um, the phenotypes vary. So anytime that you have a real phenotypic extreme, it's likely representing some sort of genotypic variation or genotypic extreme, and that actually can help us drive this even at a relatively coarse level. Power tools. Molecular genetics is a power tool. They're fast, efficient. When you misuse them, they're dangerous. And so we have to always put these sort of in a context of what are we trying to get done and what's the best way to get it done. And you know, they're, they're attractive, but we can actually misuse them and then we can hurt ourselves. I find that over the decades, um, that livestock conservation is, overlaps people that are involved, the cultures that are involved, <clears throat> and the animals that are involved. And if we leave out any one of those pieces, then we're likely to have less success. So this is a neighbor with her pet chicken, and you know she loves that chicken, and that's actually that's part of the story. You know, the, the chicken and the little girl are a team, and we need to kind of respect that team. So for success, we, need to, we do need to worry about population structures. We do need to worry about the way we mate animals. We also need to be concerned about human management. And so the goal is a theoretical framework that's going to work every time. Now that, you know, that's the goal. We're not going to hit that goal, but we can at least recognize the question. I do work with the Livestock Conservancy, even though I'm a professor in a vet school. Um, that's a non-governmental work in the, uh, group in the United States, and we do collaborate closely uh, and more and more closely with the RBST. Um, I've been a life member of the RBST since the mid-1980s. And also the Red Combiand, which is Spanish. It has nothing to do with color. A red and Spanish means network. And this is a group of uh, colleagues that works throughout um, Latin America and the Iberian Peninsula. And what's interesting is that uh, for us in the United States, we've kind of lost the history of our Spanish 
influence, but it was actually quite early, quite broad, and it actually affects our livestock populations quite a bit. Most of our target, not all of our target, but a lot of our target is local land race populations that basically don't have the benefit of close organization or really, really active and effective um, breed associations. Those present problems, and one of those problems is definition, and the other problem is just organization. So the sheep picture is uh, Gulf Coast native sheep, and you'll notice that these views are actually quite variable, and for us that's okay. And then the lower picture is Tennessee fainting goats, and many people would not accept that that's a breed just because of the phenotypic variation that you see. That's typical of land race populations, and we somehow need to figure out you know, what's the nugget there to make the whole thing work. The population structure of the land races, to me, is often really fascinating. Um, it's a bag of marbles. It lacks hierarchy. And usually it's isolated um, herds, isolated flocks that basically communicate extremely rarely with one another genetically. Um, that presents real challenges for conservation. It also presents real challenges when we talk about uh, gene banks or semen stores or things like that. This is just uh, one of our cattle breeds is the Piney Woods cattle breed. And this is just sort of to flesh out that idea. These, each little circle here is um, one of the herds of these cattle. And these, these herds may actually have been isolated one from the other for a century. And so where the little uh, circles overlap is where they may have swapped bulls in the past <laughs> or where they're completely concentric. One herd was descended from another herd maybe half a, you know, 50 years ago, something like that. And when you look at that structure, if we're going to adequately sample this for conservation, this is a real challenge. Um, and that's just the animal challenge. Then there's the people challenge on top of it. And that, and this breed, that becomes really quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> some Americans are extreme, and these are the extreme of the extreme, and so it gets to be quite interesting. <laughs> and this is in contrast to the more standardized breeds where you usually have a more of a pyramidal um, breed structure. And this is not going to be always true, but it is, it's relatively true. So you have elite herds. Um, these are the ones that usually provide, uh, especially breeding males, to the multipliers and to the commercial sector. And as you look at this over the generations, that whole pyramid is going to get you know, narrower and narrower and narrower because it's always depending on that elite, and you're always taking out a little bit less of the elite. And I actually think that the, um, there's going to be two international breeds that really fit this well. Thoroughbred is going to be one of them, um, and the Holstein Frisian is going to be the other one. And at this point, um, I think you could argue, and we can have a nice argument later maybe, on you know, whether those breeds are actually reaping the harvest of this structure. And um, at, at least in North America now, when you go out to dairy farms, they actually do have more and more crossbreds between Holsteins and Jerseys, and that's because the Holsteins have become, perhaps through inbreeding depression, less and less um, viable and um, resistant to the environment. So this is, this is a change over the last few decades. Population structure, um, there's various challenges. These are all piney woods. Um, the foundation may have all been the same, but genetic, <coughs> genetic drift alone is going to impose differences, let alone anything for selection. And um, especially in the piney woods, uh, traditionally, historically, back when the breed was quite common, um, it ranged in the open range, so different neighboring herds would actually focus on different colors. And then when they rounded up the cattle, that's how they would separate the cattle. So the colors are variable, and just the general phenotype can be variable uh, population to population to population. And so with the local uh, breed, then we have the question, you know, which animals should we be including in this, and which animals should we be excluding? Because if you include everything, then you don't have the, you know, the fundamental predictability that is the basis for choosing a breed in the first place. Um, and in extensive situations, this can be extremely difficult because those animals are going to be more variable than they are in a very closely controlled situation. And we'll talk, other questions so far? I, I, like, I work better when it's a conversation <laughs> instead of a lecture. Right. Then we'll keep going. And we'll talk about, <laughs> then we'll talk about turkeys. And um, Philippe wanted me to talk about turkeys, so here goes. <laughs> Um, and the, 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 turkey, um, the turkey story has lots of, of 
problems for conservation, problems for definition, they're actually domesticated as two different events. Meliagris galapavo galapavo is in southern Mexico. That's going to be uh, domesticated in what were the Aztec areas, or if you're more familiar with that, the Triple Alliance. And then there's other subspecies that were domesticated in the Pueblo regions in what is now New Mexico. So we have that origin. Now it turns out that the northern ones, as far as the domesticates, are probably extinct. But then the story, um, so the Pueblos are likely extinct. The Mexican domesticates persist, um, but the wild subspecies is extinct in the wild. And some people um, touched on this a little bit, but when we talk about this conservation and we talk about some of the um, uh, conflict is too strong a word, but controversies between zoos and between domestic animal conservation. We need to remember that for some of these species, the domesticated biodiversity is all that remains. So if we don't have horses, we don't have horses. The wild, the wild ancestors gone. If we don't have cattle, the wild ancestors gone. And it turns out if we don't have Bactrian camels or dromedary <laughs> camels, that wild ancestor is gone too. So this, this, you know, basically breed conservation at that point takes on an entirely different profile and become, to me, much more important. These are Mexican turkeys. Traditional uses, we eat them for eggs, we use their feathers ritually, um, and we also use their bones for tools and broodiness. Now that sounds really stupid, but it turns out that in traditional portions of Mexico that a turkey hen that goes broody is in fact quite broody. She will sit on more chicken eggs than a hen can and be quite successful in raising them. Plus, she also expects to be on that job longer than a chicken hen, so she's not going to give up. Okay, so when they start hatching, she's going to be quite pleased because she got a day off a week early. Um, so that, that is actually one of the reasons for the persistence of traditional Mexican turkeys is broodiness. Finally, we use them for meat. Now, today in Mexico, the value per bird, and I use the symbol for dollar, does anybody know what that symbol means? It means pesos, <laughs> just thought I'd tell you. So again, for us, that's also a reflection of this profound and long Spanish influence in North America. But today, for a traditional bird in Mexico, the dollar value per bird is equal to what, would you, what they would get from an industrial bird. And that's because the market prefers that type of meat. So for traditional use, uh, you know, basically then they have, they have some um, options there. The industrial birds, interestingly, have a Sylvestris genetic signature, so the subspecies Sylvestris. Uh, that's both mitochondrial DNA and other. And if you look at the subspecies uh, distribution, the lower purple one is the wild subspecies, and then that blue one is the Sylvestris, which is the eastern wild subspecies. So what happens is the Spaniards take the turkeys back to Spain, and then they spread through Europe. And they spread so rapidly through Europe that nobody knows where they came from. And that's why they're called turkeys. Um, and some parts of this are true. Um, and and they, they eventually, that part was true, they eventually get up to Britain. And then when the English come over to colonize northern, what's now the United States, they bring those turkeys. And that's where they meet up with the other subspecies. And then they interbreed. And that's where you're going to get the industrial birds centuries later. So this, this whole distribution becomes quite interesting because the North American birds actually came from Europe. So for local subsistence in the United States, the color varied. And you have to do that for the same reason the cattle breeders did, keeps the neighboring flocks distinct. So I got the chocolate ones, you got the black ones, and that way we can keep them straight. In the fall, we're going to drive them to market, and that can be up to 100 miles, usually not behind wagons, but you get the idea. And they're used for insect control because they're very voracious insectivores. And so back in the 20s and the 30s, if you were in the South and you wanted to grow a cotton crop, you had to demonstrate to the bank that you had two things. Those two things were a flock of geese to weed and a flock of turkeys to control the insects. Now, those days are gone, but it just shows that these, these animals have more than one use, more than one purpose. Then we're going to industrialize it. And actually, the turkey industry and the chicken industry in the United States is a you know, classic example of the industrialization and stratification of uh, animal production. Broad-breasted uh, phenotype first appears in Canada, uh, not in the United States. These birds are mostly white. There's some bronze ones. 
Um, obviously, they prefer the white ones because you don't have the pin feathers um, showing up on the carcasses. Now, it turns out in turkeys that the larger your turkey is, the less fecund it is. So the less they're going to uh, be at egg production. The smaller ones are going to be more fecund, but we don't want those because we want to eat them, right? So we want the bigger birds, but we need lots of them, so then we need the smaller birds. So most of the industrial um, strategies do have two different lines. One is the maternal line, which is a slightly smaller bird. The other is a paternal line, which is the bigger bird. Um, and so the final cross is going to be a cross of those two. Now, either one of those is actually too large for consistent natural reproduction. So this, um, this system is entirely based on artificial insemination. And I, I believe there were, there were allusions to um, artificial insemination this morning, you know, good things, the bad things. It's interesting to note that once we, um, once we put an animal population under that system, that becomes a main driver of selection. And so, for example, when people are freezing rare cattle breed semen, they'll say, oh, it doesn't freeze as well. Well, it doesn't freeze as well as Holstein Frisians, which have been selected for 60 years for freezeability because they took care of that problem in the first decade. So basically, if you were a bull and you had poor semen freezeability, that, that part of the genetic variation is gone. You know, and so we do need to kind of ask ourselves what that means for long-term conservation. Now, with industrialization, we're going to have a split. We've got the exhibition breeders, which are the standard varieties. So we you know, load up our turkey, we go to the show, um, and it's quite the thing to do. And those are all based on color. And so we're going to actually standardize the colors. Bronze, black, slate, white, and red are the more common colors that are involved in this. And then there's going to be actually three varieties that are smaller than the standard variety. So what you have is the Bellsville small white, the royal palm, and the midget white. These are, they're, they're still big birds, but they're not huge. And then the other ones are going to be the standard ones, and the hens are going to be at 18 pounds. Toms are going to be, or stags, I believe you call them, are going to be 33 pounds. And then all the way up to the industrial, which was maybe twice that size. So there is some standardization, but within that, there's actually quite a bit of phenotypic um, consistency. So the little arrows kind of show you how this whole thing fits together. You have the wild subspecies, and most of those are actually doing quite well, except the Mexican subspecies, and that one may be extinct. Um, that jury is still out. The local Mexican domesticates, um, there's ongoing genetic characterization of these. There's DNA studies going on now at the University of Cordoba in Spain. And so we'll see how those all fit together and uh, what their uh, genetic makeup is. Those go to the European pre-industrial birds. So, but then you have a Mexican origin and then a bottleneck. So those, those populations are actually quite interesting, especially if we can get to the genetic characterization piece of it. And if, if all of you are turkey breeders and you want to participate, I know where to send the samples in Cordoba. Um, and then we're going to bring those back to North American. So we have North American heritage birds, some of which are probably still a, a sub, uh, sub collection of the European pre-industrial birds, but most of them are probably have some local wild turkey influence. So that's a little bit different. And from that, we're going to get the industrial bird from um, selection. And you do kind of wonder if the background of the success of that selection was the, the diversity that came from that um, southern Mexican heritage plus the eastern wild heritage kind of coming together, giving you that diversity that you could use for that selection. So conservation issues. For each wild subspecies, are there any Galapago left? And we don't know that. The local Mexican birds are really interesting, and they risk being lost from introgression, from um, birds, actually industrial birds, but also a, a step back from some French birds that are being introduced. Then the European pre-industrial birds, again, genetic characterization be a real good next step. And then the long North American heritage um, Basically, these are a long-term composite of different subspecies, and, but they still remain a conservation issue. And then the industrial. And then why would I list that as a conservation issue? There's millions of these things. Every time there's a, one of these mergers of these you know, transnational giants, they will actually eliminate some of those lines. And so now there's debate on whether there's only one industrial turkey line or whether there's two. And you know, given, the, given the fact that we have the wild subspecies, we're probably not in bad shape, but you, know, you do wonder as these things 
collapse and collapse and collapse if there isn't a conservation issue. Now, without, outside of that industrial setting, there's no role for anybody to play. Nobody else can pull this trick off. You know, but the question still needs to be asked. So in the United States, we have the heritage birds. These are non-industrial, naturally reproducing. And the superficial level is color. Otherwise, they're fairly similar. And the breeders will cross the varieties back and forth. So there is a question of how distinct those varieties are genetically. Um, these are the varieties. The white holland is white. Um, black is black. Bronze is bronze. The bourbon red's red. And then we also have slate buff, Nebraskan, and perhaps others. So in the past, they would have been very carefully selected for these color varieties. And then the bronze. Now, this gets to be a question. Because in the United States, a bronze turkey is a bronze turkey is a bronze turkey. But there are some distinct lines. So Wishard and Kardosh are two lines that have been separated from everybody else for decades. And so the, the genetic question is, how distinct are they? And we don't know the answer to that, but that could actually drive conservation issues. Now, the, of course, the problem is, phenotypically, they're all relatively similar. So you can't, you know, the average person couldn't go out and say, oh, this is that, and this is a Kardosh, this is a Wishard, this is another bronze turkey. Does that matter? And I don't know the answer to that. So we have uh, the, the DNA studies. And earlier studies have conflicting results. And probably because the underlying assumption is that all varieties are homogeneous. So that, again, a bronze bird is a bronze bird is a bronze bird. Um, but if there's distinct subpopulations, then depending on the study set that goes into the study, the answer you get is going to be different. So that, that kind of drives that um, question slash controversy. <laughs> And for heritage turkey conservation, um, we do have this wonderful link of product plus demand. And so the traditional, um, for us, um, we only have one thing that unites us as Americans, and that turns out to be Thanksgiving Day. <laughs> and and, um, and th this, is, this is real. <laughs> um, and so basically, anybody can come to America and become American, which is a little bit different than a lot of places. Um, I suppose you all come close, um, but, well, for example, I can't, I can't move to Japan and become Japanese, okay? A Japanese can move to America and become American pretty much in every sense of the word. Um, so, but we all get together on Thanksgiving Day and we eat turkey. <laughs> and this, this cuts across, you know, ethnic groups, this cuts across religions, it cuts across everything. Now, because we've been able to link the heritage bird with the demand for this, the demand for these birds has increased 10 to 20 fold. Now, this is minuscule compared to the demand for an industrial bird. I mean, minuscule. But as a result of this increased demand, the hatcheries have increased their breeding populations of heritage birds. And so now we're getting more and more selection for productivity and you know, actual um, commercial acceptability for these birds, which is really pretty exciting because, of course, traditionally, that's what they were. You know, that we lost that, and now we're regaining it. And so we're um, making progress in that way. Um, Tom, this is Jeanette Berenger with the Livestock Conservancy, grinning ear to ear with a traditional bird. I asked for a picture of the bird cooked. There is no picture of this bird cooked because they were all so excited that they forgot to take the picture. <laughs> so we have conservation targets, and this gets down to the difficulty of what we're doing here. Um, the American Poultry Association recognized varieties. They're an easy target because they're defined. Other old established varieties, like the midget white and the buff, those are not well defined. So that becomes a problem. Um, and then we have the question of the role of isolated strains within varieties. And then we also have the role of the varieties that were not standardized uh, put into there. So turkey conservation has a whole lot of questions and not very many answers. So we have the relationship of breed to variety and you know the question of what is a genetic resource in the first place. And turkeys sort of involve all those questions. Do you have questions on that? Yes. Several comments have been made about <coughs> exhibition breeding. Do exhibition breeders have any possible contribution to the problems of uh, survival of the breed? Um, do the exhibition breeders have any contribution? Yes, they do. And um, that, that's a thank you for asking that. Um, a lot of the turkey selection has been devoted to perfection of plumage. But 
underlying that is another issue, which is um, the bird under the feathers, basically. And they have not completely ignored that. And what we are finding, um, some in turkeys, but more in chickens, is that when we educate the, breed, the exhibition breeders to the traditional selection techniques for you know, body size, um, egg production, and things like that, that those birds are actually winning the shows. And so when we, when we combine those two, we get, um, we get a, an outcome that's actually better than you would with either a lot um, for the exhibition breeders, but also for the productivity of the birds. So that's actually been uh, quite good. Buckeye chickens would be the best example so far, but Delaware chickens are coming along. And some of the turkeys that are selected by these old techniques are actually winning the shows. So the, but there, there definitely is a place for that. And um, I'm the last person to take pot shots at the exhibition world because at, in, you know, in North America, I don't know what happens here, but in North America, the chicken breeding gets kind of weird. Because, um, well, because you're only after a phenotype. You're not after necessarily the genotype. But um, especially when you have extreme phenotypes, that does save extreme genotypes. And so that, that in its own right is useful. Okay, well, there are, that's it for turkey questions, okay. So we also have archaea populations of breeds. Um, talked about cattle, talked about horses, extinct in the wild, so we can have archaea populations of breeds. And we're um, lucky in the United States because we, um, we have a huge English influence and they came over early and then was isolated in the United States and then you changed what you did and we never changed what we did for some of these. So our earliest imports of Devon cattle were from New England. They're the old triple purpose type, and these have become an important part of local culture and agriculture as a resource, especially in New England, especially for ox production. And um, so the question is, what's the ideal ox? And no one knows? Intelligent, biddable, she gets 75%, which is pretty good. <laughs> because nobody else got anything. Okay, and they're fast, okay? And this is something that in North America, everybody's forgotten, except the Devon cattle breeders. And so they, they actually wanted a controllable, fairly active, reasonably nervous animal, because that made the best ox. And so, you know, basically this whole thing is saving that model. So when you go to historic living farms, in North America, they all will say everything about Devon oxen. They will have a yoke of oxen. The oxen will be short horns. The reason for that is a, a yoke of Devon oxen standing around all day long becomes dangerous because <laughs> they are bored to tears because they're bred to work and they need to work. So it's an archaic type. And the milking type, which is actually this triple purpose type, now only, as far as we know, only occurs in the United States, um, which is an interesting issue. And so. Um, when, when they do the analyses and they include American Devons, this is probably the Devon that they're including is the milking Devon, okay? So that's gonna be a little bit different. The beef type in the United States is increasingly replaced with New Zealand bloodlines because anything you import is always better than what you had at home. And this is a real problem because it goes both ways. Um, so in our, in our situation, Devon cattle production for um, grass-fed beef has become extremely uh, common, and the New Zealanders basically marketed their semen, so basically everybody in the beef world started using that, and we've almost lost our uniquely North American lines of this breed, and you know that's something we should steward a little more carefully. American Belgian horses would be another issue. Um, the roan horse is a European Brabant Belgian. The kind of yellow horse is um, an American model, and you can see that generations of selection and um, genetic drift and everything else have actually changed that into a very different animal. Jacob sheep, uh, the American type is probably closer to the original traditional type. How important are subtypes to breed definition? I don't know. But, because if we list each subtype, then all of a sudden we've got a huge list that's like 15 times longer, and then we have a really, really, really difficult job. But, um, so, Casting the net broadly avoids the losses, and in the case of North American Jacob sheep, they actually are the only spontaneous model of Tay-Sachs disease in humans that um, occurs in an animal bigger than a mouse. 
breed boundaries, especially for local breeds. And when I talk too long, just make me shut up. Um, but breed boundaries. So the question is, what's in, what's out? So uh, we have colonial Spanish type horses. Um, these are all roan horses. But the top right is um, a horse from South Carolina. The bottom right is a horse from Wyoming. And then the bottom left is a horse from New Mexico. They're all fairly similar, but that horse from New Mexico is actually a little bit different. And so that population was excluded for a host of reasons, both genetic and phenotypic. And those actually should lead you to the same conclusion. So are we going to lump these together or are we going to split them? And we, this gets to be a real issue because um, now, 30 years ago, nobody wanted to be on our list. Now everybody wants to be on our list. So this is a problem. So the American Quarter Horse Foundation in the 1950s, three different gene pools, one for racing, one for cutting horses, which are the ones that work the cattle, and one stand on the end of a halter and look pretty and do nothing. Um, and that's important because those gene pools actually don't communicate with each other. You know, and so do we have one breed named, we actually have three breeds, and I don't know the answer to that. Morgan Horse, foundation in the early 1800s, so more of a traditional breed. The traditional purebreds are now rare, but they're historically important. So do we split those off from the main breed? And our presence idea is yes, we would, for the cultural importance and also for the genetic reasons. Which gets down, what's a breed? And so organizing local breeds is a challenge. We rely on foundation, followed by isolation, uh, followed by selection. And then selection is both environmental and by the human owners. And how does it all fit together? Are these genetic resources? This is an Exmoor pony. Um, so how, how do the ponies on the hill interact with the ponies in the paddock? And I believe that you all face some controversies with this. No, and it's an important question, OK? And Dartmoor. You know, how about the ponies in the hill, the ponies on the paddock? You know, those are important questions. And if we're trying to manage this as an intact, isolated gene pool, how do those pieces talk to each other? How do those pieces um, exchange genetic material? And how can we use them to not lose portions of these breeds? And that is an, I think that's an important question. Um, this was this was palmed off to me as an Exmoor. We can have that discussion <laughs> later. <laughs> and I just went ahead and accepted it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll come back. Okay. Now, um, so I work a lot with uh, Spanish livestock or Spanish origin livestock. Criollo is an interesting word. It, it, it's Iberian in origin, born in the Americas. This is slightly different from Creole, which is, has a French origin, which means anything, that, anything mixed up in America. So we're going to use Criollo because it, it, it's more true to what's going on. In the case of the cattle, the cattle came from only 300 founders five centuries ago. So this is a pretty narrow genetic base. And then it, it radiates throughout the Americas so that we end up with um, different types all the way from Argentina on the right to the southern United States, oops, sorry, on the left. This is Argentina on the right is the United States and everything in between. And we end up with those problems of foundation, isolation, selection, human versus environmental. Um, the, the bull in the top is a San Martinero bull. And those are interesting because those cattle, in the face of a jaguar, they group together and they will fight off the jaguar. Whereas the humped zebu cattle will just all run away. And so he's going to catch the slowest one. So in places where <coughs> The farmers raise San Martinero cattle, they don't kill the jaguars, whereas where they raise the zebus, as the jaguars age, they'll go for the easy kill, and there's some conflict there. So, you know, basically beef production in the Llanos, the speckled one is actually a dairy type bull from the Dominican Republic, and then the, the lower one is a bull in Bolivia, selected for milk production. How many of you like working around dairy bulls? OK, so this is a dairy bull. And I said, oh, I'd like a picture of this bull. And the guy goes, oh, you would? And he runs over, and he hugs the bull. This is a mature bull. And he puts the halter on him, and he stands him up. And the reason they use these is they are um, monso. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, it means that they're very, very tame, and it's genetic. OK, so that's one reason they use these, is because they're, you're going to be safe around them. So do we have one breed or many? 
We have the foundation, we have the isolation, but we have this adaptation to different environments. So we have ones from the highlands of Peru, the Altiplano. We have ones from the cold regions of Chile and Argentina, the Patagonico. And then for milk production, we have the Savareño, and then the San Martinero for beef production in the humid tropics. And then the Blanco Rey Negro, which is a polled one uh, on the lower one, which looks like a British white, but I don't believe we show much <laughs> genetic connection. Um, and those are important because they're, they're parasite resistant and they're also resistant to leucosis. So, you know, different things. And if we, if we subdivide these, we probably are a little bit more adequately um, saving the genetic diversity. They all have longevity. Here's a cow that's about 18 years old, probably produced 17 calves. They're docile, they're fertile, and they're all well adapted to whichever environment they hail from. Also, they're taurine cattle from North Africa. So this is interesting because this is a radiation of cattle um, breeds and domestication that's a little bit different from the rest of Europe and a little bit different from the rest of Asia. So any way that you crossbreed these things, the heterosis is going to be incredible. And this is actually one reason for their rarity is that people crossed them, you bought the bull, the cow was home raised, the calf came out great, the bull got all the credit, the cow got none of the credit. But it turns out it's that whole genetic distance between these that accounts for the ex excellence of these criollo cattle. So when you, when you factor in the fertility and the longevity, these are more productive than larger cattle. In the south, in the south part of Argentina, the cow to have is a herd. <coughs> and they will wean 40% of a cow. You, know, you have 100 cows, you get 40 calves at the end of it. You don't want criollos, but when you breed those criollos, you're gonna get 80%. And so they're, now they're waking up that maybe, you know, a really, really productive smallish cow is better than a subproductive larger cow. Now I'm not, that's not about Hereford cattle, that's just the wrong environment and the wrong cow. But these are land races with no breeder organization. So breed definition is the first crucial step. And you have a phenotypic matrix that you can help enroll animals into this. And this, this is not a matrix of quality. This is just breed type. Uh, the bull on the left is a Piney Woods bull with a very Iberian phenotype. The cow on the right is a Texas Longhorn cow with African or Asian influence. And you can tell that from the shape and the character of the horns. And so we can use that to help um, isolate what we want. We also have some local breeds that are not um, Iberian. So this is a United States land race, the Randall cattle. North Atlantic region, we can't tell where, but certainly some English influences as well as Scandinavian. Only one strain remains of this once common type. Founders, two bulls, ten cows. But now we've been able to use close attention to breeding protocols to retain genetic variation. And so now there's 500 of them. And over time, the red reappeared. So this would be like the Shetland story. Um, the red reappeared. The question was, keep it or reject it? Well, historically it was in there, so we keep it. I'm still waiting for the brindle to come out, but it hasn't yet. For the international breeds, we do have some important reservoirs of international breeds. Um, these are unique. Um, milking shorthorns, we probably have the largest population of pure shorthorns. Now we can have an argument about whether they're all milking type or not. 1949 split into dairy and beef, and then you see here that the dairy introduced Holsteins, the beef introduced Maine Anjou. Interestingly, DNA studies have shown that many shorthorns have no African or no Asian influence in the DNA. Now, I, I quibble with some of the interpretation, I quibble with some of the data, but the fact remains that despite the fact that the, the shorthorn has influenced so many breeds internationally, it still stands out really, really peripherally as a genetic resource. So the, the purebreds are extremely important as genetic outliers. And in the United States, we have a native designation. Those trace back to the Coates Herd book or to the 1830 importation of, from clay. Um, and those two actually were, of course, pure shorthorns. The heritage breeders are now organized, and they're documenting live cattle as well as frozen semen. And we have a, a fair amount of bulls that were frozen in the 40s and 50s that they're using back today to actually broaden that genetic um, basis. And this would be a plea for cooperation across the pond, which is you know, increasing in momentum. This would be a breed where that's really, really important, you know, because um, to the extent that uh, things can go across uh, and influence um, the population, it'll work. 
Dexter's also important. The United States never permitted upgrading. Some sneaked in, imagine that. And so we're gonna talk about five different classes. Legacy, traditional, group three, group four, and group five. Guess which ones we like. Um, the legacies have complete pedigrees back to foundation animals. Um, this includes Irish and English animals before upgrading. We do include wood magic, and you saw a graphic there where they're outliers. We consider that that is actually from genetic drift and selection rather than introgression. We might be wrong, but I'm the one talking, so there you go. And, um, but there's only about 50 animals. Now, for what you would consider purebred Dexters, the number this morning was 17. Somebody said it? 17. So the, you know, the, the plea is, if there's any way possible that we can actually get these things to communicate across the pond, and that's, that's difficult, because you know, you've got regulatory issues, you've got genetic issues, but um, basically between the two, and you know, hats off to Andrew Sheppy because he had located old semen. You know, basically, we can't use it, you can use it. Hopefully, we can generate some bulls that can be shipped over as frozen semen. This is the sort of thing where these international breeds, this is really important. Our traditional ones are Legacy Plus Part and Bullfinch, which is a bull in the 50s. Um, in the UK, this line produces off types. In the United States, it never has. Why that reason is, I don't know. This is about 500 animals, so we accept these as the real deal. Um, then group threes is where we start to get appendix and experimental animals in the pedigree. Um, you would start allowing uh, upgrading beginning in 1943. And then the group four is the bull Saltair Platinum, um, but these are horned phenotype instead of polled. His pedigree is in dispute, and we're working on it. Um, there's four entries in his pedigree from upgraded animals, and there's doubts about the polled origin. The, the polled gene in this was reputed to have been a spontaneous mutation, but it is identical <laughs> to the polled gene in other breeds. So I think that's telling us something. And then 40% of our breed is a polled phenotype tracing back to this. So if you add 34 and 40, you get that three quarters of the breed goes back to this one bull with a questionable pedigree. And that's what gives heart attacks to some of the breeders. So it's important to keep the legacy and traditional portions viable because basically that's the most remote parts of the breed. And Andrew Sheppey contended um, in 2016, and obviously my, had seven pure dexter cows. This may be wrong now. Um, I think he excluded wood magic. Um, we were having wonderful conversations when he unfortunately met his demise. Um, again, you have semen, and collaboration could make transatlantic conservation a reality. Our efforts are spearheaded by Judith Spinagle. Pedigree validation, DNA analysis, all those things are important. And we do have, uh, you know, within these purebred lines, black ones, dun ones, and red ones, and both the short-legged and the dwarf types. That's wrong. And, but, yeah, both the long-legged and the dwarf types, that should be. And the main trend, though, is trending towards red and trending towards pole. And so the, the selection is taking this away from its traditional root. Other ones, Ancoli Watusi, we have some. They're, they're not all that common, but they're safe from political turmoil or disease. And breed conservation is now seen as valuable, but it, it always depends on individuals. So Andrew Sheppey, Joe Henson would be another one, Emre Bodo, and uh, Libby mentioned him, Herman Martinez in Colombia. Others set the stage. And so we kind of follow along and we validate what they do and kind of uh, make sure that their legacy continues in this breed conservation movement. Achieved by real people in real situations. This is Lady Cottrell Dormer <laughs> hugging her cow, and I just thought that was a great picture. Um, each personality is going to bring some quirks. Each one's going to bring some strengths, and somehow managing that across the board is important. <clears throat> Redefinition is always central. We talked about that. Phenotype, history, cultural aspects. Finally, the genotype. Any one of those in isolation can lead you into error, so that you have to do it all. And with that, I will thank you for including me today and take any questions.